In this video, we look at how to select appropriate test data to solve a problem. We look at how you justify this test strategy, the importance of user feedback and how to use trace tables. So once you've written a program, you need to be able to identify and suggest suitable data that you could use to test it in a variety of scenarios. Now, in order to do this, we're going to look at a very simple program that's shown on the screen, and we're going to suggest some types of test data you might use and why. So I've identified 10 separate tests here and 10 bits of test data we could use. If we take a quick look at the program, we can see it prints, uh, it prints three lines of text to the screen. So it's like a menu system. One, new game, two, save game, and three, play game. We set choice to zero, and then we're going to say, while choice is less than one or greater to three, we're gonna keep prompting them to enter a choice. So the idea is we want them to enter one, two, or three, and if they enter anything else we keep prompting them. Well the first thing you should always try and do is test for no data being entered at all and this is a special case. This isn't strictly what we call invalid data or erroneous data but it certainly isn't something you want the user to do. So I will check whether the program um, behaves correctly when no data is entered. We then have what the exam board call erroneous data, and that's data which should be rejected by the program. Now, in this situation, the program should only be accepting one, two or three. Anything else, therefore, according to the exam, will be considered erroneous data. Now, you can't possibly test for every single piece of erroneous data, but you should test for a range. So you can see I'm checking what happens if they enter a character, test two. What happens if they enter a symbol, test three. I'm then checking some numbers. So what happens if they enter minus six, which is below the range, eight above the range? What happens if they enter 2.5? Now, in this situation, the program would actually accept 2.5 because it's in the range 1 to 3. But of course, what we'd like is for the person to reject it. We'd want it only to accept the whole numbers 1, 2 or 3. So which of those should be considered erroneous data for our situation? We then want to be able to test what we call normal or typical data. Now, this is any data which should be accepted by the program without causing errors. So with our program, we're wanting to accept the values 1, 2 and 3. So they would all be normal or typical data. So we have got a test here that's testing the input 2. Now, why am I also not testing 1 and 3 as normal data? Well, let's have a quick look. You also need to know about boundary and extreme data. Now, this is data of the correct data type, which is on either edge of the accepted validation limits. So one and three are indeed what we consider normal data. But in this circumstance, they have a special category and that's boundary data because it's data of the correct type which exists at the correct valid limit. Now, you've obviously probably worked out, therefore, that boundary data is also naught and four. Because remember, the exam board's definition is data which is on either edge of the accepted validation limits. Of course, naught and four shouldn't be accepted. So they are also technically erroneous data. But once again, you're better off referring to these special cases as boundary data. Now, when being asked to identify suitable test data in the exam, you'll probably be given a slightly more complicated example than the one we've just shown you. So have a look at the image on the right here. What data could we use for this car park ticket machine software? Well, the first thing to note is there are lots of different variables here. You can see that um, the system is going to be charging different amounts depending on how long they stay, one hour, two hours, indeed arriving after 9.30. We can see there are special rates for a Sunday and in evenings. 
we can see there are certain times when the car park isn't even open, so we need to consider that in our test data. Now, there's a large variety of tests and therefore appropriate data that we could use. Here's just a few suggestions. Test whether someone can do half hour parking, an hour, an hour and a half and multiples thereof. What happens if it's a Sunday parking situation or evening parking past 7 p.m.? What about parking before 9.30 or after 9.30? And tests that involve entering data where someone's trying to park during invalid hours. Now, as well as being able to identify appropriate test data, another vital skill for understanding program flow and testing the accuracy of an algorithm is what's called tracing execution or performing dry runs. This process involves examining a printed extract of program code and running through the program. You literally take each line one at a time and write out the current state of every variable in what's known as a trace table noting any output the program produces. Every variable in the program should have its own column in the table, and a new row should be added if the state of any of the variables changes. Trace tables are an excellent way to track down logic errors in a program. Let's work through one now to see how it works. So first, we start by identifying any variables in the program and we put each one into its own column to create our trace table. So we can see we've got a variable called number so that goes into a column. We've got a variable called counter so that goes into another column and we've got a variable called total so that goes into a third column. We've also popped an output window down here where we're going to show any output as it occurs. And you'll note down the bottom there, it says when the first line of code executes, number equals print, enter a number, we're going to assume the user enters the integer 5. So we're going to work through this code line by line as if we were the computer executing this program. So the first line of code executes and the user enters a 5. So the contents of the variable number has changed. It now contains 5. Whenever this happens, you update the row for that variable in the trace table. So number now holds five. And of course, we've updated our output window. The next line is total becomes equal to one. So we've updated that in our trace table. For counter equals one. So we've initialized counter to one. And you can see we've updated that in our trace table to number. So we enter our for loop total equals total, which is one, times counter, which is one. Well, one times one is one. And that figure goes into total overwriting what was there. So the total of the, the value of total has changed from one to one. Now, you might not update this in the trace table, but to be really accurate, it's probably a good idea to do that, to show that you know the value of one is being replaced by another value of one. We then hit the end of the for loop, next counter, and this increments the value of counter by one. So we've updated our trace table to show that counter has gone from one to two. We go back to the top of the for loop. Total now equals total, which was one, times counter, which was two. Well, one times two is two, and that gets overwritten and stored back in total. So we've updated our trace table. We reach the end of the for loop, and we increment counter from two till three. We go back to the start of the for loop. Total now comes equal to the current total, which is two, times the value of counter, which is three. Well, two times three is six, and that gets written back in total. And we hit the end of the for loop and increment the value of counter from three to four. Notice we're very carefully stepping through the algorithm methodically, one line at a time, as if we were the computer program executing. Every time a variable updates, we change its value in the trace table by adding an extra row. So back to the top again, we're going for counter equals one to number. Well, number's five and counter's four, so we're still going into this for loop. Total becomes equal to the current value of total, that's six, 
times counter, which is 4. 6 times 4 is 24, and this gets placed into total, so we've updated it. Next counter, so we increment counter to 5. We go back to the start of the for loop. For counter, which is currently 5, to number, or numbers 5, so 5 still equals 5, so this is OK, we're going to go into the for loop one more time. Total becomes equal to the current value of total, 24, times the value of counter, 5. 24 times 5 is 120, and we update that into the value total. We increment counter to 6. We go back to the start of the for loop. For counter equals 1, 2, the value in number. Well, the value in number is 5, counter is 6. So now we do not execute the for loop, and we skip beyond the end of the for loop and we output the value of total, which currently stands at 120. So what is this program actually doing? Well, having stepped through it line by line, noting down the contents, noting down the output, noting down the variables as they change, you've probably figured it out. It's outputting the factorial of the number entered. Factorial five, for example, is one times two times three times four times five, which is 120, and it's the value we ended up with. Now, throughout all the videos in this section, we've been mentioning again and again the importance of the end user. So it's worth us leaving this section just spending a minute talking about the real importance of user feedback. Gaining feedback at regular points throughout software development, as opposed to just at the start, is essential. The user should not simply be someone who you consult at the start of a project and then never speak to again until the product is complete. When you have regular feedback with the users, it helps to keep a project focused. It makes sure that what you're developing is actually the system they really need. It provides plenty of opportunities for discussion, which may actually push the project in a different direction. And don't forget, it will also make the user feel part of the finished solution. Having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key question. What are the features of the different ways a programme can be tested?